Hey, yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Chicano Logs. This is your non-monolithic look at the Latine community, at our raza. And uh, we're coming at you every couple of weeks to share stories where I, just a little Chicanito from the east side, uh, comes in here and has conversations with folks from our comunidad and folks connected to the work that we do um, and to the stories that need to be uplifted. We're always uplifting cuentos. And in the spirit of uplifting these cuentos, you're going to really like our, our guests that we have today. And I'll introduce her in just one second. Um, but if you're hearing us for the first time, um, the Chicano Logs is a two dope production. You can uh, subscribe to us on social media by following at two dope teachers on Instagram, on Twitter, on where else are we? We're on Facebook. We've got a TikTok that we never upload anything to, but um, but we're responsive to things there. Um, if you have show ideas, if you have feedback, if you would like to just get connect connected with Tudo Nation, you can hit us up, teachers at gmail.com. And if you're excited about supporting and uplifting people of color created independent media, um, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash teachers. Um, and then at the break, We'll tell you a little bit about our sponsor, Cetera Investors. So I'm here on an unseasonably warm day in uh, Denver, Colorado, although my guests probably wouldn't consider this warm given that she's in California. Um, but we have an amazing guest today, journalist, publisher, award-winning author, Leticia Ordaz. Welcome to the Chicano Logs. Thank you. It's so great to be here with you, Gerardo. You're an amazing person, and thank you for sharing my story. Uh, no, you. Okay. Um, so we, we met at the uh, conference for the Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents in San Antonio and just really enjoyed the conversation that we had and just getting to know the work that, that you've been doing, that you've been hustling towards. I, I don't think you understand how much it inspired me to just, you know, continue to do the stuff that matters to me. So it's a really fun, um, you know, conversation and just super honored that you're here on the show. Um, so I want to start off with just a little bit of your story. We're all about just kind of knowing who people are, who who are the folks that show up into um, into our lives and our spaces. Um, so how did your life experiences lead you into this world of storytelling? It seems like that's kind of the, that's the umbrella over the work that you do is telling stories. So as a journalist, as an author, as a publisher. Absolutely. Or well, I'm an immigrant child. My parents are immigrants. I grew up in a small town in Northern California. And growing up, I never saw books that reflected me. And I think that's all how it got started with my publishing world and my desire to publish books, just not feeling represented, like something was missing in my life. I really enjoyed books, but boy, would I have loved to have seen someone who looked like me on the cover of a book as characters in books. So that's where it all began. There was a huge void in my life growing up because of that, you know, a lack of literacy and culturally relevant books. And then when I became a mother, I continued to search for those stories. And sadly, a lot of those stories still weren't there and weren't being authentically told. So that's when I decided to write my own stories. And that's how I created Cielito Lindo books specifically, because when I began submitting my story to publishers, one specific giant publisher said, we love your idea. We love your concept for Mr. Macabre, but does it have to be in Spanish? Because I write bilingual books. So mm -hmm. that kind of hit me hard because this publisher also said, why do you want to market to this community? Because Latinos don't read. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. So that, that's when we have to create change. If we don't see the books out there that we want, then it's our responsibility to write them. Let's let's dig into that a little bit because there are a couple of pieces I think are really important for the audience to hear right now. Um, the first is the power of representation. Like I think that this is a term that that gets used a lot in in public discourse, and yet we haven't seen significant changes in how our communities are represented. So talk a little bit about what that what what representation means in our community and in communities of color in general. But when I started writing books, I wanted to do it for my children. I said, how important would it be for them to grow up knowing that their culture is beautiful, that the color of their skin is beautiful, that everything about them is perfect. And so I began writing books with them as characters, my two little boys as characters, Maxton and Bronx. And it, it really exploded because when I finally published my books my way and took them out to schools, 
kids on Zoom because we had to first do it through the virtual world. It was 2020, uh, March of 2020, when my first book came out. So all these plans I had to to do a nationwide book tour kind of got stomped, but it didn't stop my mission. I was able to to reach out through social media and so many people got behind my mission and all of a sudden I was reading to kids nationally a nationwide schools were opening their doors to me and I was doing zooms with them and doing assemblies uh, virtually and after I would present the book I would have Q&A and a lot of the kids would be crying like tears in their eyes during Q&A and I would ask them what you know impacted them about the book and they said that the characters looked like them. It said, those kids in that book look like me. Yeah. And they were just so proud of that. It wasn't, it was happy tears. It was yeah. like, finally, oh, yeah. I'm yeah. being seen. And even them being so little, sometimes people think, oh, they don't notice. They notice. Right, right. yeah. I, I was just going to say that, right? Because I think <laughs> like there is this notion that young children are just kind of like, wandering cluelessly throughout the world and they don't think about things like racial identity or like cultural identity consciousness and that kind of thing but what you're seeing is that that is absolutely the opposite that that matters to them it matters to them it matters to their parents we were doing like nighttime assemblies as well because i really like to get the families involved. So I worked with schools and I said, can we do a literacy night? Can we present to the entire family? I want the abuelitos, the abuelitos, anyone who lives in the home to experience the magic of reading and to just generate a culture of reading in our community uh, to break those stereotypes. I don't think that Latinos don't read. It's just that a lot of times families don't have these culturally relevant books in their home. I work with a lot of communities to get books into the hands of kids. And what we're finding is that sometimes this is the very first book that that family would have owned. Yeah. So it's very important to like provide access to those books. And yeah. even the parents and the grandparents will be in tears saying, you know, I wish I had these books growing up. So it's very yeah. powerful. Yeah, I think it, as you kind of speak about that, as as you say that um, for a lot of families, this is the first book that maybe the family has owned. I think about my my spouse who came here um, in the late 1970s. They were undocumented until she was in middle school. And um, and just the difference as we were getting to know each other between her home and my home. I have a white mother, very educated from the United States of America. And so um, we always had books around and for her, it was good. And she would have these kind of like frustrating trigger moments in professional settings when they'd be like, and share what your favorite book was growing up. And if you didn't grow up with books, um, that's a very loaded situation to be in. You started to touch on this a little bit, but I'd like you to um, kind of expand on it a little bit. Why do you think there is this perception that Latino families and children don't read? I think it's because it starts with organizations that donate books to families. And I see it every day now that I've been in this literacy work. I've been in situations where it's a literacy event and we have, say, a public library handing out books. And then I'm there in my line handing out books. And oftentimes the, the library line, there's not one. They all come to my line. And that's what I'm seeing is that organizations are not bringing cult culturally relevant books to these events. And sometimes they're bringing old books and nobody wants a torn right. old book. That's when you right. go into a community, you really Some have kid to colored in it and it's, you know. Yeah, you have to bring books that reflect that community. And I think oftentimes these groups that bring books to organizations like that and events they leave saying, did we really need to do this because nobody picked up a book? But they're not really right. looking at what they brought and should they have That's brought right. those books. Those weren't exactly. the right books to bring to a black and brown community. And yeah. when I see 200 people deep in line waiting to talk to me, waiting for my signature, waiting for a book, uh, that tells me that they do want these books. They just want the right books in their yeah. house. It's so, it's so, thank you for sharing that. Cause like, as I was going back and reading my copy of Mr. McCaw that I got, um, and I was kind of reflecting on my own journey. I, I love to read. I have, I have a reading disability, but I love to read and I've always loved to read, but I was thinking about what were my favorite books growing up. I mean, it was, it was Ferdinand the Bull, right? That was probably my favorite one. And then I used to read Encyclopedia Brown because I love this idea that that a kid like me could solve mysteries with my mind but there was always something that didn't feel like a strong connection in that way so what you're saying is that in terms of um of especially children's literacy 
it's a lot of the same issues that we run into in other aspects of our Latina existences, whether it's you attended my session on neurodivergence and how there's a perception that the cultural stigma is the reason that Latina children don't get special education services, they don't get neurodivergent supports, but it's because there's also not access to folks who are experts and culturally adept and informed about who we are that all, that plays an equal, if not bigger role. So you're saying it's a similar situation in literature. It's not that there's no interest in reading or literacy. It's that that the children's pub, children's book industry has failed to connect with our children and with their families. Absolutely. Then I also think that it's the school's responsibility to, because we can't just leave it on go. the publishers. That's right. Like a lot of the times we bring these book fairs to our school and we keep bringing the same book fairs to our school. So how about yeah. thinking outside the box? I know a friend in Los Angeles, she has Miha books. She features my books there as well as other culturally relevant books. And now schools in LA are starting to get her to come to these schools. And these kids are feeling so connected to the books that they're finding, someone who looks like them. They want to read so bad. And it's really opening up the doors to literacy. Every time I visit a school and a school does a district distribution where every kid's going to get a book and it doesn't matter what your income is because I yeah. don't want to go to a school and sell my books because I would have been that one child who didn't have any money for that yeah. book. Yeah. So when we open up the doors and when schools bring these culturally relevant books, kids want to read that book over and over again. That is what I'm hearing from these families is like, Always. now I have a reader in the home and it was that simple. It's giving someone a book they could relate to, they could see themselves in. And not only that, but these kids are now thinking, hey, you wrote the story. You look like me. Guess what? Now I want to write a story, too. So it's mm. opening up the doors for kids who are seeing themselves as authors from early on. And, and that's that. so important because when I was in school, I didn't even have an author visit me. So I didn't know that someone that yeah. looked like me could even be an author. Could even be an author. Oh, my gosh. Our, our stories are so parallel in that way. Um, I remember, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how you're elevating these stories and how the, there's that amazing um, saying, we lift as we climb, right? And I think you really exemplify that idea of lifting as we climb. But just a quick story before we go to a break. Um, I When I was a senior in high school, I was given an assignment. We were going to do a choice reading project for advanced placement um, literature. And so we could read any, we had, to, we could read any four books. They had to be in the same genre. And this was kind of like our student choice things. And so I also don't want to um, bash this teacher too much because that was really forward thinking for the 1990s that you would let kids read whatever books they want to, <laughs> right? <laughs> Still a little bit of a hot take in some circles. Um, but so I had, I had recently begun to be very curious about my my heritage as a Mexican American, as a Chicano, as a as a person who is a descendant of the original people of the Americas, and as a person who could be considered Latino Americano. So I was really interested, particularly in magical realism. And so we were supposed to write this little proposal, and I wrote this proposal up, and um and I and I had wanted to read the Death of Artemio Cruz, like Water for Chocolate. 100 Years of Solitude and Bless Me Ultima. Like those were the magical realist books I wanted to read. Um, the teacher returned it to me and said, no, you're going to have to do something that's a little bit more rigorous and a little bit more uh, relevant to um, the AP exam. And I just remember being so frustrated and disappointed because it was this very clear message to me. And maybe it was under the guise of AP exams and that kind of thing. But what I heard was, the stories of you and your people and your heritage are not relevant. So I ended up doing existentialism, which was fine, but it was kind of disappointing. But from, you know, so we see how important this is, even as kids get older, you know. Yeah, that's a subliminal message right there that they're sending that our stories don't matter. And that's what we're trying to fight. They are yeah. important. They do matter. They absolutely matter. Um, you know what else matters is uh, financial planning for the future. Um, so see that like, segue. See, I'm kind of good at this. Um, so uh, we've got these great partners um, out of uh, the Pasadena area in California, Satera Investors, LLC. Um, my friends, Alex and Tori, who are actually going to come on the podcast. They have some phenomenal stories. Alex is a super young dude. I know he wouldn't mind me saying that super young dude who didn't grow up with generational 
generational wealth and wanted to be able to set himself up and his family up for building generational wealth. And now that commitment has extended um, to all people, especially teachers. So if you're a teacher and you're listening to this podcast and you're a brand new teacher and you're just trying to make ends meet, this idea of generational wealth may seem really like out of left field. You're probably thinking, oh, yeah, sure build generational wealth right after I go to the moon, right? Maybe kind of difficult for you to think about. Well, Alex and Tori have come up with a model that will allow folks to build generational wealth without having to start with generational wealth. And so um, listeners to Tudo Productions can go to www.alexandtori.satera.com and put in the promotional code Tudo Teachers. No, no, Tudo, just Tudo, and uh, get a discount on some of their services. Hit them up. Uh, we've already had some listeners go to them, uh, particularly educators. Alex is super familiar with pension plans and retirement packages and 403Bs and all those kinds of things, and he can guide you into this thing. So check him out. Satara Investors, Tori and Alex, proud supporters of Two Dope Productions. We will be right back. So I want to um, jump into this next uh, segment um, with you. And, and, if, and if for some reason you're just tuning in, this isn't live. Y'all go to the beginning. Listen to the beginning of the show. What are you doing? Um, but I'm here with Leticia Ordaz, journalist, Emmy award winning journalist, buried the lead on that one, um, <laughs> and um, book publisher, author, uh, founder of Silito Lindo Books, uh, talking about the power of stories. So um, I want to talk specifically for a minute. You have a few other books, um, but I want to talk specifically about Mr. McCaw, Lost in the Big City, or El Señor McCaw, Perdido en la Ciudad. There are some really important choices regarding language, regarding character development, regarding setting in every aspect of the book. Um, and it's and it's funny because I've read the book multiple times since we met, because in every time I read it, I notice something else that is there, a very subtle signal to the reader of who this story is about and who this story centers on. Can you talk about just that, just those choices that you made in all those areas? There it is. <laughs> there it is. And the artwork is beautiful. We talked about that before. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, this is uh, one of my new favorite books. And yeah, Perdido en la Gran Ciudad. It's all about uh, following a magical bird's adventure. And it's really all about culture and family. And I weave in one of my favorite childhood songs, Cielito Lindo. Yes. Very, uh, very yes, popular in the song. song. Yes. <laughs> and it's about an abuelito who has passed, but these boys are remembering abuelito through their magical kite. And then the kite gets lost in the big city and yeah. they have to follow clues that their grandfather has has left them to finally reunite with their lost bird but it's all about speaking how my family speaks and speaking how our community speaks so often when you publish a book uh with a traditional publisher sorry moving around over here sun is on my language. face okay <laughs> <laughs> so often okay, when ahead. you publish a book sometimes you work with certain publishers and they want you to use language that we don't use here in the U.S. So I really um, embrace that my characters are going to speak like real people talk. Yeah. I remember one uh, publisher in Spain saying, when you're ready to publish a real Spanish book, come to me. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not. So you're getting finish. you're getting gate kept on both ends of it. <laughs> so there is a gatekeeping in the English children's like book publishing world, and then there was one in the Spanish language book. It's kind of like it's a it's a dual sort of. Um, there's two gates that people are trying to close to you. Absolutely, but they're not closing them because they're going to stay nope. open. I'm the publisher, right. so I, I can right. make these decisions. <laughs> That's but, right. Um, Ultimately, like, you know, my books, you won't find them to be Castilian Spanish as you would some generic producing of books that they just take what's written by, you know, an American author and yep. they just translate it and don't really look at the authenticity of right? the language. Google Translate, edit, and we're good. <laughs> <laughs> we can't be good because when our families are reading these stories, they feel disconnected because they're like, that's not how I would say autobus or that's not how I would say this right. word. And, you know, obviously it's very regional and different parts of Latin America say things totally. differently. But I always focus on 
how we speak um, Spanish, how my family speaks Spanish, you know, being a Mexican American in the U.S. Yeah. So true to that. And, you know, I just want people to connect with my stories and I'm not trying to be anyone that I'm not. So I have to speak how we talk in our community. Yeah. And I noticed some things too, in terms of setting. So I think that, that, that always struck me as a little bit of an area of uncertainty for me, because when we talk about Spanish speaking people, we're talking about almost 30 countries um, in the world where some version of spoken of Spanish is spoken and, and the, the dialects and the various ways of speaking, it can really change, but it feels like you drop some little hints that also situated the type of Spanish that the children were using within a context. So like, I look at the buildings, I look at where they are. Can you speak a little on that? Like how, how you kind of link those things together? Absolutely. Well, this was really a love letter to my city, Sacramento. Uh, this is where I'm from. This is where my children are growing up. So yeah. I wanted to feature landmarks of my city. I, the Tower Bridge, very iconic, bright yep. yellow, in your face kind of bridge. And then we have the historic old Sacramento where people discover it from all over the world because that's where the original gold mining happened right. in the capital city. So I just wanted to feature um, you know, a lot of landmarks and and places that people are familiar with even if they're yeah. not necessarily from our city. So that was yeah. important for me. And the setting originally starts in Mexico because that's where the boys are. That's where their abuelitos villages, when they hop on a plane, come to the capital city and discover that their kite goes missing in an airport fiasco. Yeah, so cool. Um, we're going to move on to um, this other series that you are are developing and that you've developed this series around the, the uh, statement, that could be me, the girl on TV, that could be me. And so um, I love this because it's another. So in Mr. McCaw, it, the big you, you talk about it being a love letter to your community and to your culture and to your family. Um, talk about what um, th what that could be me does for representation in, um, you know, in another way. Absolutely. Well, I teamed up with a different publisher originally to write that could be me. That girl on TV could be me because when I pitched the story, Mr. McCaw to them, they had read my bio and they said, your story is really neat and deserves to be told. It was a time where immigrants were being attacked, Latinos were being attacked, and you know they needed a shining story of an example of immigrants who were doing good in this world. So when I was first approached to write a story about myself, uh, I thought, well, what's so special about my story? I think sometimes we undermine what we're actually doing. But after giving it much thought, I agreed to write my own story about being in the news business, about being this little girl who didn't see myself represented on television and having this dream of being that voice for my community and kind of letting people know more about the news. Because I think sometimes when people see the news world, they think of this glamorous world where, um, you, you know, someone does your hair and makeup every day and they don't focus on how hard, um, the hard work that goes behind it, the many markets that you have to move to, to prove yourself as a young journalist and that yeah. there are still not many people of color in the business and just encouraging right. more Latino voices to join the news business, which is very challenging. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. And it's funny because I, you know, I think one of my, um, one of my early dreams was actually to go into journalism and maybe that's why I started a podcast because it kind of gives a, a little bit of a taste of that. I, I, I think about all of the barriers and, you know, these stories because of the way you tell them, um, they resonate deeply with me first. And then I start looking at where they are in the rest of the world. It's the same reason I didn't go to theater school because mm -hmm. it was going to be really expensive and I would have had to really stretch to make it work. And really the deal breaker ended up being, I mean, how many Chicano actors are there that are going to really be successful? It's going to be worth it. And so I didn't pursue that. And so I think, and I think with, through your experience, uh, what I hear you saying is that it's like you are so focused on doing the thing and, you know, just, you, yes, you overcame things, but I think you get to this point where it's like, well, I took care of the mundane everyday things and I did it. Why is that a big deal? And then you start realizing that it's really a big deal. Um, it, you're doing so much cool deal. stuff. Yeah, go ahead. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's just a passion. And I'm glad to be able to share that story and just to give people an inside look. Uh, it's the first broadcast book for children. So it really gives people, you know, an eye on television and, and so what great. it's all about. It's so much more than glitz and glamour. It's about really informing our, our community and giving everyone yeah. a voice. And so from that, from doing the TV, I thought, how cool would it be just to create my own series of different positions in the world that people hold so cool. in our community, really featuring Latino characters, yeah. you know, and just, and just making it, you know, that superstar teacher could be me, yeah. you know, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> so many different things that could, yeah. can happen with that series and just really giving our children a, a, to read an autobiography as someone yeah. that they can relate to and aspire to be a, not a fictional story, uh, but a real life story. Yeah. And so I'm really you're making me that. yeah you, and that's so clear um you're really making me think deeply about about this particular thing is particularly in in your line of work the person that we see on the news is often a symbol to the community as somebody who reflects us a, a friendly face we come to and over the course of doing research of course um i i wanted to check out kind of some of some of your how you maintain yourself professionally like as as a journalist and it did really occur to me. It's like, I mean, why, especially I'm mean, here in Denver, Colorado, in the Denver public schools where I work, you know, over 50% of our students come from Latine backgrounds, mostly Mexican backgrounds. Like, why wouldn't one of us be the spokesperson for our community, be the friendly face that we come home to in the evening? And so I think that's such a powerful thing. Um, so many things you're doing. It's it's beautiful. Um, the, the last thing I want to get to before we get to the big important question um, is that we talked a little bit about this notion of lifting as we climb, right? The idea that one pursues success, not only for themselves, but so they can bring up other people. Something that is very near and dear to your heart is your commitment to elevating the voices of other creators and aspiring authors. How are you enacting that really important of the work so that you know that it doesn't end with Leticia Ordaz, that it doesn't end with Cielito Lindo books, that that it's only a beginning for others. How do you, how are you doing that? Oh, what's so amazing is that I am letting youth see themselves as authors and not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. It was just a few months back that I published an anthology with 88 migrant children from Los Ooh. Angeles County. The anthology is We Come From Greatness. We all came up with the title. I coached the kids on how to write a book. Uh, they all had their own story. They had one to two pages in this 128-page book that is now on Amazon, and all of the proceeds go back to them so they can go to college. But what's so cool is that they are now going to have this on their resume. They can now say they are published authors. Uh, they told their stories. When I went in there, a lot of them didn't know what to believe. I worked with their school district, and they were thinking like, Am I really going to be an author when this is all said and done? And so they wrote their stories. We worked together. And when I finally delivered the book to them, it was so emotional. We held a ceremony with the parents. They got to read their stories out loud. Uh, everybody was in tears. Their parents oh, could not believe that their children were now authors. And it was just like beaming pride for our community. And, and now we have 88 young authors out there. And I think it's really empowering them. And I don't want to stop there. You know, I want uh, my company to be the outlet for so many more creators. You know, we're all writers. Everyone says, I don't know how to write a book, but you do. Everyone has the power to write a yeah. story. We all have a story Absolutely. in us. The difference is some people actually make it happen. They put it in writing. We all have an idea in our head and it's just so important to, to have that creative outlet, even on scratch paper to type that yeah. first draft. Well, that and that's the thing, right? It's kind of like that first draft. I think that's what holds <laughs> a lot of people back. It's kind of like, yeah, I mean, you're not a published author the first time you put pen to paper, but that's why there's editors and that's why there are great publishers who believe in your stories like Cielito Lindo Books. Um, who are going to give you the tools that you need. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm smiling at the notion that we have 88 human beings who will have a publication credit before they have a driver's license. Isn't and I cool? love it. It's so beautiful. Um, Leticia, ugh, so inspired by what you're doing. And, you know, I think too, I always think about how we connect this work, the yeah. elemental spiritual substance of the work to other areas. Um, like why wouldn't I do a, 
program that uplifts and develops young podcasters. Why wouldn't we do that? Right. And why wouldn't we do this in (laughs) other like areas, right. In other areas, because at the end of the day, the solution to lack of representation is to lift as we climb. Um, Really enjoy you sharing your brilliance right now. So all of this representation, publication, telling our stories, all of this is important, but Big question that we're going to conclude the show with today. I want to hear your top five anything. So it's anything. And if you had time to kind of think this through and see what your top five anything is going to be. Well, I haven't given it much thought, but I do love to travel okay. and I do love to to visit children all over the world. And so I would say that my top five are Puerto Rico, Mexico. I would also say it's Paris. Here at home, Northern California, Yosemite, and Lake Tahoe, my top five. <laughs> Yo, that was that was good. And I have been to most of those places. It's, you know, it's really funny. I've never been to Lake Tahoe. Like, I've been to Paris, but not to Lake Tahoe. That's yeah. cool. Um, and so are these places where you've taken your children or where you've just gone? So four of the places. My children are dying to go to Paris. We haven't done that as a family yet, but I think they're probably old enough now, nine and 12, but they (laughs) went with me to Puerto Rico and we had a a literacy mission and we got to take our books to children impacted by uh, Hurricane Maria. Yeah, And uh, we also go to Mexico every year. And it used to be just a fun beach vacation, hang out, uh, just absorb in the culture. But now we visit an orphanage there that's really near and dear to our heart. We've also partnered with the Boys and Girls Club to bring them literacy in Mexico. So all of these trips that just used to be to explore are we're really finding a purpose in literacy and giving back to our community wherever we go. Love it. Expect nothing less from from your top five. Fire <laughs> top five. Um, had a chance to be in Puerto Rico um, for at the last Alas conference. And it was just such, I'd never been and in just such a beautiful, powerful, incredible community of people in San Juan that um, really enjoyed it. Um, So how do um, folks who want to learn more about your publications, about your work, about Cielito Lindo books, how do they find you? How do they get connected to you? Um, How do they get updates on everything that you're doing? Wonderful. Well, the easiest way would be to follow me on social media, Cielito Lindo books is my handle. You can also follow my personal account, Leticia or Daz TV. That one's uh, pretty easy if you can type my name out. <laughs> yep. And also at celitolindobooks.com. You can also send me an email if you have a story idea or a manuscript. Celitolindobooks.com or celitolindobooks at gmail.com. Gmail. Stay awesome. connected. <laughs> yes, that's amazing. And folks, if you have that story that you are dying to tell, um, you have a publisher here who's willing to hear it and willing to learn about it. And so... Um, Leticia Ordaz, thank you so much for joining me on the Chicano Logs today. Can't wait to get this episode in front of people and just love all of the work that you're doing. You are truly an inspiration. Gracias. Gerardo, you inspire me. Thank you so much. Great talking to you.